So this is uh, a project which is working with uh, Jack Burns at um, University of Colorado under the Lunar uh, Program. And what I'm going to be talking about is the deployment of our retroreflector. Uh, for the most part, I will skip very briefly over the science and some of the other topics. Uh, first, this is not a brand new experiment. It's got a lot of her heritage. The Apollo arrays have been up there 40 years, and they've done a lot on the interior of the moon. Uh, initial definition of the liquid uh, core, its existence, size, and shape, core mantle boundary, viscosity, display, uh, and dissipation, etc. The goals of um, LROD 21, the future long-term goal is uh, much greater ranging accuracy. The difficulty at present is that as the moon librates, the Apollo reflectors rotate. And so, crudely, we don't know whether the photon came from this one or this one. And so that gives about a two centimeter uncertainty, 20 millimeters. What we're aiming for is using a single corner reflector, uh, one that Good deal larger, um, something like this. This is not the flight one you'll see shortly, but uh, of this dimension. What that means is that we'll get a signal that is uh, essentially the same as Apollo 15, and Apollo 15 is the station that people can do the ranging to. The intermediate goal is uh, going for one millimeter accuracy with only a few returns necessary strong signal, then we'll have multiple stations instead of only one station that produces millimeter data, and we can expect a lot more returns. Those are regular ranging stations, we can expect hundreds of ranges per month rather than a few. Um, we are looking at the deep part of the interior. Grail looks at the outer part. Uh, outer part is much stronger for their science, uh, and that is a we're essentially being a complement to what they're doing. Basic design, um, and I won't go into it, but uh, we have to address very seriously the thermal problems, and this is done with a lot of simulations, and it's done with details on the design. Uh, in the middle image is a, one of the issues was, can you really make a corner reflector with the accuracy that I would like? And so this is a fully flight qualified uh, retro reflector that uh, met the uh, 0.2 arc second accuracy, which is about two and a half times beyond the state of the art of what's being flown. The p image on the right is the package that is uh, uh, being thermal tested at the uh, INFN facility in Frascati, Italy, a facility that is specially developed for looking at retroreflector arrays. Uh, this is a model of uh, the package. Uh, it's about one kilogram, requires no power, no communication. Uh, this is a uh, discussion of the testing. Uh, the design is more or less completed. Uh, we're doing the simulations. This was done under LSSO and under Lunar, the current work. Um, and that's the chamber. And we're currently an outside evaluation of TRL of 6.5. There are three ways that we could deploy this. Uh, the simplest one, the easiest one, is on the lander, something like this. Um, there's a difficulty with that because during, during uh, the transition between lunar day and lunar night, there's expansion, contraction of the lander. Uh, for example, on Selene 2, this, is, this may be something like two centimeters. And so we really, this, uh, a low lander like that one, if that's a model from uh, NSLI, 
uh, would be one to three millimeters. The second is to emplace it on the regolith. Uh, the main difficulty with this is it requires an arm to do the dis displacement. Uh, the advantage is that we can make a uh, support structure out of silicon carbide and that means that we're at a sub-millimeter accuracy. Um, the third method is to uh, recognize that the regolith is moving up and down and if we would go down a half meter or more, the, the crust is so uh, thermally uh, non-conductive that there's very little change in temperature and so therefore if I would anchor it at a one meter level or a half meter level, then I won't get the uh, day-night rise. Uh, the difficulty on this is we've got to do drilling. Uh, drilling in Apollo days uh, had some problems. This is something Jack Schmidt gave me. Uh, he and Gene Sonnen uh, are trying to extract a rod and uh, <laughs> so we need to improve on this. Uh, the direction on this is uh, some work that Chris Sackney at Honeybee has been doing on pneumatic drilling. Uh, and the idea there is that we have a rod and we blow air out here, it blows the debris out. Instead of having to compress, the, either compress the regolith or extract it up a rod a screw. So if we could now convert over to the video. Uh, Chris is over in the other building at the uh, sandbox with uh, JSC 1A uh, material and we will have, if we can get the uh, interfaces, we'll have a live demonstration of the current, okay. There's Chris, and this is a this is a corner reflector. Actually, it's not again the flight one; it's that one, uh, and it's in a housing. And this is a uh, dust shield. And what he's going to do is to here turn on uh, 15 pounds of pressure. Uh, this actually works better in vacuum. It, uh, okay, okay, uh, let's go back to the view graphs. Uh, this is another one, uh, what was done in the lab uh, of doing this. We also did this out on the Hawaii tests um, at Mauna Kea. But the next question is, how do we do this on the lunar surface? Um, in order to address that question, Chris has been working with the astrobotics people on what can be mounted on one of the Google X uh, prize landers. And this was the resulting design. Uh, this would be on the lander. Uh, the only mechanisms, a pin is pulled here and it slides out. As it gets to the end, spring-loaded rises. A separate pin is pulled at the head. That drops it. And when it drops, uh, the gas chamber is punctured and that starts the gas flowing and then it is dropping in is released by this 
and is emplaced. And Chris has tested this uh, pneumatic drilling uh, in vacuum. Uh, there's another video, which actually was too large, uh, that would have sh shown the vacuum tests. And has also done it on the Vomit Comet at lunar gravity in the vacuum. And so, uh, apart from the issue that we don't know how good uh, JSC-1A is for the lunar regolith, to the best of our ability to test it, it seems to be working quite well. So the current objectives, uh, we'd like three packages on the moon. Uh, that's needed to determine the lunar rotation, which is a critical part for the lunar interior. Uh, we will be able to meet the GLX uh, launch schedules and they multiple opportunities, both in Team FRED and Astrobotics would like to carry the anchored employment. Uh, the package weighs less than a kilogram. The deployment is probably about two kilograms. Uh, TRL 6.5 and we could be ready to supply them in 14 to 16 months, although we do have a number of flight qualified parts. Um, the ranging is done here on Earth and it's not, basically not a cost. It's done by the International Laser Ranging Service and they do satellites mostly, but they also handle the uh, lunar ranging and all of their data is publicly on the web. And the final thing is that with the Google X Prize, we would be, uh, have simultaneous observations with GRAIL. Thank you. In uh, your deployment, you mentioned a concern about the movement of the regolith with the, uh, in the diurnal thermal cycle of the moon. What is, I'm, I'm, familiar, I'm unfamiliar with that problem. What is the uh, reference or the data that you cite in order to, to say that that's an issue? Uh, I'm not familiar with uh, lunar data on that. My numbers come from uh, having a model of the uh, temperatures in the regolith that were coming out of Apollo using that and the physical properties of the regolith in order to compute uh, with the motion which is of the order of 400 microns, half a millimeter. The, the seismometers did pick up on that too, the all sub seismometers. Any other questions? No? Okay, thanks Doug.